Well, my name is Charlton, Charlton Mills. I have been doing ministry for about 14 years in the mine ministry specifically. Um, I was part of the Ingradson team back in eternity and a half ago. <laughs> I am the youngest of three boys, actually. My oldest uh, brother. <laughs> yeah, the youngest of three. <laughs> and of course, I got called baby until I was like 25. I'm 27 for the record. I'll let you know when you talking. Yeah. He's so tall. Um, I graduated from College of the Ozarks with a bachelor's in uh, public relations. And I partially went down to get my master's of divinity. And I'm also a former artist. <clears throat> so, in the midst of all of this insanity of life that has been, I was part of a, of a uh, what we call a Christian cult. So, who am I or any of us? <laughs> in one of the most fascinating questions I think to ask is when was I saved? Because, like, I'm confident in my salvation. I truly believe in Christ. There is no doubt in my mind. But the question of when I was actually a regenerate Christian, like, I don't know. Because it was the age of five. I had a, like, a revelation that, you know, right in the back of my neighbor's car when we were going to church, that I never actually accepted Jesus into my heart. My parents are Christians, so they professed, and so I just was default to Christian. But then later on, when I was 13, I had like huge struggles with uh, all kinds of moral issues and stuff like that. And it came to be that, well, am I actually saved if I'm not acting according to God's will? So maybe it was then. Well, maybe not. Maybe it was actually when I was 18, because at the age of 18, I took this class at College of the Ozarks called Christian Worldview 2, where I had this doctor, uh, Daniel Chin, basically take my life and shred it to pieces because everything that I had known about the gospel was wrong. And so was that where I was saved? Those are all kinds of questions that I have. And like, at this point, I'm like, I think I'm good. Like, when it was exactly is almost irrelevant now because mm-hmm. I know for a fact that God's put his, uh, his hand on me and he's, he's saved me. Now, my family, I have always been a Christian, and I hasn't been any point in my life where I haven't thought my parents and my brothers and to be Christian, except they were part of what we would call a Christian cult, and especially my mom and dad. My brothers, I'm not sure where they are. I think they're a little bit on the less culty side, but my parents for sure are still going into uh, kind of cultish doctrines as you will. So we got to define first what a cult is. Because when we talk about cults, immediately somebody thinks, oh, like, you know, Satan worship and stuff like that. But that's, uh, there's a nice definitive line between cults and the occult. So when you talk about the occult, we're talking about that that kind of, like, cloaks and, you know, rituals and Satan worship and sacrificing things like that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about is much worse because it affects us in our daily lives. And it could be somebody you know is part of a cult unknowingly. So to kind of go through the definition of a cult, it is a particular system of religious worship, especially with reference to its rites and ceremonies. More about that is an instance of great veneration of a person, idea, or thing, especially manifested by bodily or admirers. So what's kind of interesting about that is that kind of sounds like Christianity. Is Christianity a cult? Not exactly, and we'll get into that in a little bit. And the way that I would better define it is it is a small set of people who believe the same way about something, especially surrounding a person, object, or idea. So cults don't actually have to be God-centric. They could be something else. They could be centered around a particular political figure could be centered around a thing, like idol worship or something like that. Could be a type of cult. But we, once again, not talking about any of those. We are talking about good old Christian cults. So like I mentioned, the occult is satanic. That is what people immediately go to. It's not what we're talking about. We are talking about Christian cults. Christian cults are defined in a manner of its God, the one true living God, is the center of attention. However, he is portrayed incorrectly. Not only that, but the religious structure surrounding it is also, um, you could say, 
led and manipulated by the uh, the religious leaders, the people in within that kind of uh, ministry context. And that's why it's so dangerous, because that means that your church could have been a cult. Hopefully, it's not. And for me personally, my church was a cult. Some common Christian cults that we have: Jehovah's Witness. They believe in the one true living God, but the way that they believe him, it's not quite right. They actually don't believe that Jesus was God. They believe that he was man. That in and of itself makes it heresy, but not only that, they also have cultish uh, signs of actually being a cult, which we'll get into soon. Mormonism, very similar approach where we have the Book of Mormon. It's placed alongside the Bible as true scripture, which we would say no. We say the Bible, the Bible is the only... Um, the only source of truth. You can't find it from some other uh, text. And then there is the Prosperity Doctrine. That's where I came from. In the Prosperity Doctrine, this is um, what I would like to describe as very you-centric, where it feels like you're going to a church with other believers, but in reality, you are worshiping yourself. And that's where it kind of turns into a a nice little mess. And there are other non-Christian cults that um, that we could talk about with when it comes to um, how cults are in existence, how they act, how they look, those kinds of things. So when looking for a cult to try and figure out if your church or a church that you are examining is a Christian cult, specifically, or just a cult in general, these are the kinds of things that you will find. First, they oppose critical thinking. Now what that means is uh, members are expected to think in certain ways. Any thinking or challenging of what is proclaimed as the true gospel is shut down. It, oftentimes you're considered crazy or just like you don't understand or, you know, that's, that's not right. Like instead of challenging critical thinking, it's shut down. Those are very common for uh, many types of cults. Next is isolation and penalization. So isolation is you are removed from those around you. What a great part of the Christian church is, is that we are able to be in a body of believers greater than ourselves. We are able to relate to and have um, fellowship with one another. Like the people in this room, none of you go to my church, but yet I am still part of the church along with you. So that is something that is not allowed, because you are taken, you are supposed to listen to these set of speakers, you're supposed to interact with your church and your church only, that's pretty much isolation in a nutshell. And penalization is if you step outside of that line, uh, there is punishment for it. Now, in some contexts, this is different than others, but more or less it can be um, overt or inert. So if it's overt, you have actual punishment like you are um, in the Jehovah's Witness. I actually have a friend who was a former Jehovah's Witness. When he stepped away from the faith because he was moving on because he realized that it was, a, it was a false doctrine, it was a cult, they actually excommunicated him on the spot and told him not to come back until he professed Jehovah's Witness as the only um, religious system there is. And so, like, there is an overt punishment. He was left out. Now, that leaves him in a really awkward place where he is now alone. And the people who he called his family, his church family, are now his enemies. And that leads to a lot of problems with uh, especially finding a new church and trying to build new relationships. It can be really difficult after that. Um, and then inner is typically when you have those friends. Maybe the church itself doesn't push you out and... Uh, excommunicate you or anything like that, but instead the members within the church are more uh, distant. So what'll happen is like, you say, oh yeah, I, I heard you left the church. And they'd be like, oh yeah, and then I found that you know this, this, and this was wrong, or I just wanted to go try a new church or whatever, and then I'd be like, well, yeah, I don't think I can interact with you anymore, I, I can't be your friend. And those are the kinds of things that happen all the time. <clears throat> Next is um, doctrines outside of scripture. A very good sign of a Christian cult, very easy one, is if somebody likes to use a certain, whether it be a speaker's notes or whether it be an actual other text, such as the Mormon, as the Holy Scripture, that is a sign that you are in a Christian cult. 
because it should be Bible to Bible. Of course, commentaries and um, people who are speaking on a subject and you know, pastors interpreting scripture, so on and so forth. Those things are fine, of course. But it's when you take something outside of scripture as scripture, that's where it crosses the line. Uh, next is the loyalty to leaders. So from my own experience, like the pastor of my church, now granted I should give you a little bit of uh, information about my church. It, I went to Faith Life Church in Branson. It was a congregation of like a thousand every every week. And there were also thousands more that visited online. And what ended up happening is you are so disconnected from your pastor that he was something of a celebrity. Not only that, he was like a step south of God. And that's where things kind of get into a bad area. Now we, we know from like, especially people who attend smaller churches, having that access to your pastor is very important to try and say, okay, well, you know, I'm struggling with this. What is something that scripture says about this? Having that shepherd to lead you is, is wonderful, very important, I believe. To put it over to what I was raised with, it was more like, yeah, this guy, whatever he says is true. Mm -hmm. What? Untouchable. Untouchable, yeah, yeah exactly. And it, it came down to that. The, in the entire, what was it, about five years that I attended that specific church, I never once spoke to the pastor. So I'm like, you know, you might think, well, I came across him. I, the closest that I got, I was about, you know, the distance between me and Sam was about the closest I ever got to him. And it's kind of like, that's unheard of in a lot of Christian circles, because it's like the pastor is the one who's supposed to help you foster growth. Instead, that was democratized to other people. And, um, you know, you're kind of told to keep in your lane and keep in line with whatever you're supposed to instead of having that open access to your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, so the loyalty to leaders comes in where even the leader, which we once again think one step lower than God, basically, had his set of leaders who then were one step lower than him that he would follow. And maybe the leader himself would also say, well, these other ones that are of a similar vein so like my pastor was Keith Moore. If he then said, well, you should also listen to Benny Hinn, well, then he was kind of put on the same pedestal, one step lower than God, as uh, my pastor was. So those are the kinds of uh, loyalty to leaders that you find there. Um, next is dishonoring the family unit. This is kind of one that is a huge red flag that's pretty easy to find. That's why it's also a lot less common. Um, when you examine like a, a small church, you'll find that it's very close-knit, where people interact with each other on a daily basis or a weekly basis at church. In some of the context that this is, you'll find that it disconnects you from that kind of intimacy with others, where you'll kind of be like a drop in the bucket of people who attend this church. For me, that was very relevant because I was one in a thousand who attended that church. I had like no significance in the church. I could barely even serve in the church without having to jump through leaps and bounds because I wasn't one of the select few. Those are kind of where it dishonors the family unit as a church family. And then also, more specifically, the dishonoring of the church family comes in with, um, when you think about like the church family, your actual biological family, having that separation between members as, okay, this is where you are supposed to go, this is where you are supposed to go. So as a youth, you're supposed to go to youth group. As an adult, you're supposed to go to the adult class. And in those specific sections, they would have everything set up aligned for what you are. Now that in and of itself doesn't sound like a big deal, except when it starts separating you from your family and starts focusing on you when you become older to also follow that same type of doctrine. Basically, an indoctrination separates you from family, separates the, uh, the the parents as the progenitors of the faith into their children, and instead separates that, puts the children and the parents in their own separate boxes, teaches them, indoctrinates them, then they grow up to also then perpetuate the cycle. You'll find that a lot, less, a lot less commonly, but you also will find it a lot more subtly if they do it properly, I guess you could say. Uh, next is crossing the biblical boundaries of behavior. Um, it, I know for the Catholic Church especially, which I could argue is a cult, 
ha they have a big issue with what the Pope says is law. And that can also carry over to other churches and stuff like that, where whatever the leader says is law. doesn't matter if it's counterintuitive to scripture, what they say is law. And then um, in separation from the church, when, uh, like I alluded to earlier, that's more of the, uh, comes in with penalization, where you are actually separated and isolated from the greater community at large of Christian believers. <clears throat> so at Faith Life Church, like I said, I'm a former cultist. I was part of that cult scenario where I was manipulated. I was taught a false doctrine. And so I kind of wanted to go through a little bit of what the uh, what a day in the life of a member of Faith Life Church would kind of go through. First of all, there's a lot to talk about faith. So if I was to ask you, what is faith, what would you say? <laughs> Belief in Christ, what do you mean? Just a real belief in what comes to not like actual sight. Just trust in him. That's good. Did you say something? No, that's just trust. Trust in Christ. Trust in Christ. Trust in Christ. So when you kind of put these all together, we can kind of come up with a, okay, this is, you, when you have faith, you believe in God. You, you trust God. You put your faith in him. Now, there's kind of a nuance to faith that is kind of lost in what ends up happening. Because when we talk about faith, we also like to quote the one scripture in Hebrews, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, which is great, right? So that means that, according to what we've said, you trust God that if you have faith in him, that he will give you the desires. And there's suddenly the nuance is lost, where now we've kind of added to faith what wasn't intended to be there. We still use the definition of faith. So we have scripture, and, I can, and I'm going to go through some scripture later. You know, it says, have faith in God. Whatever, whatever you say to this mountain move, be cast into the sea. Whatever you ask for, Without doubting, it will be given to you. That's scripture. So if I was to say that I have faith in God to that he will move this mountain for me, that means he will. A lot of people at that point may go, well, hang on, you're, you're missing something. We'll get into that later. Next, there's a lot of talk about money and blessings. So what ends up happening is there is a huge emphasis on your own personal prosperity. Hence why it's called the prosperity doctrine. In the prosperity doctrine, we talk about like you know having money basically as also having blessings. So if I was to say this person is blessed or I blessed to this person, typically means that you gave them something physical, something monetary, a car, cash, whatever. That is not what we would call blessings. What would we call blessings? Waking up. Waking up in the morning, having life. <laughs> yeah. What else? What? The fruits of the spirit. The fruits of the spirit, sure. All these kinds of like inner character things that come out, like that's huge. It's a very good thing, especially to to ministry later on. Saint Peter says, "Spiritual blessings." Yeah, spiritual blessings, the Holy Spirit entering us. That's pretty huge as well. All those things, but they would actually equate blessings not to the internal what. God has done in you, but instead what God can do for you. And that kind of the nuance, once again, is lost. And then uh, there's not really much real education. The reason I would say that is it's more along the lines of you are taught the same thing every week. Um, in the, like to give you kind of a, a week by week, we would always start off with some praise and worship, and then we would go into our pre-offering sermon, which was like 30 minutes. And he would talk about the same topic every single time, and that was giving. Basically, like, what it means to give, also what it means to have faith, and, like, you know, you, what's the one verse you uh, give, and it will be given to you? Um, yeah, that, that too. <laughs> give, and it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. That verse is quoted all the time, because it's, once again, hey, this is, you give, and it will be given to you. And that was preached all the time as well. 
Um, and then at the very end, so it has a, you know, the 30 minute section on preaching about the prosperity doctrine basically every single week, which would be kind of our offering. Then we'd have the offering, some little songs about that, which our pastor wrote specific songs about that, which <laughs> in, I, I kid you not, one of the lyrics is, angels are working, bringing the money in. Oh, I'm literally not kidding. That is actual lyrics of a song that my pastor wrote. <laughs> um, and then at the very end, you're left feeling good. So in your church, I'm sure that you're taught some good lessons, right? Like you go in, you might learn, like I remember attending Samuel's church, we talked about Revelation for several weeks. Mm-hmm. That would literally never happen in this church. <laughs> and instead, it's all about like, you know, these are the good things that happen. And we, to give people kind of a smile on their face, so they'd be feeling good. There was not much conviction. There wasn't much call to action as far as like living out a good uh, life of character. Instead, it became about you. And it became about making you feel good. And that's why I like to call it kind of a human-centered gospel, where it becomes more about you as a person and less about God. So in the prosperity doctrines, a major one is healing. So where do we get that from? And also you might know, picked Benny Hinn, classic healer. Scripture says that we're healed. Isaiah 53 says by his wounds we're healed. James 5.14, is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the, elders of the church. They're just talking about putting hands on them and stuff like that. Psalm 146, the Lord gives sight to the blind. Exodus 23.25, I will take away sickness from a member. 2 Kings 25, I have heard your prayer and have seen your your fears. I will heal you. Jeremiah 17, 14. Heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Luke 6, 19. Because power was coming from him and healing them all. Jeremiah 13, uh, 37. Uh, 30, 17, I can't read. But I will restore to you health and heal your wounds. Mark 5, 34. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Hey, we got faith in there, too. <laughs> Psalm 32. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. Sounds to me like God wants us to be healed, right? So, doesn't he? Hey, let's talk about wealth. Scripture says that we should be rich. Luke 6, 38, give, and it will be given to you. Press down, shaken together, and running over, will men bring into your lap. Matthew 6, 33, all these things will be given to you, it says. 1 Timothy 6, uh, 17, God richly provides you with everything, for your enjoyment. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Hey, you got 9, 8, now you got 8, 9. Crazy. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. 3 John 1, 2. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health, just as your soul prospers. Now, I want to just stop here for a second. And in these two sets of scriptures that I've given, that I've given you, did anybody notice anything weird about them? A lot of them are just fully out of context. <laughs> they are out of context. <laughs> I love the example of this last verse. I deliberately picked this last verse because this is my least favorite verse in the whole of scripture. Third John one two. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in all good health, just as your soul prospers. Now, does anybody know? Much about John, uh, Third John. Yeah, and so this is the second verse. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't they kind of like mess? Like First John is actually like the meat of the message that was written, and they're kind of like messing with letters, so it's kind of like. Third John is like the letter to the person he sent it to, and then they got kind of distributed more widely with the second John, and then third John the one that was the most generic, and this is the actual teaching. So third John the most personalized and the most you know, it's less of the actual teaching and more of John's sentiment to these people he cares about. And so, like in this instance, it's less of a hey, this something's true for all believers, and no, you know, this is John's heart feeling to the person he's He's saying this to you, going, I really hope that you're doing okay, that as your soul grows and prospers, I'm hoping God's 
taking care of you. And it's, it's not so much a proclamation as this is John, John expressing his love for this person. Yes, that's exactly yeah. right. What that's kind of friend would you be if you didn't want someone, a friend of yours who was sick to be better? <laughs> I hope that you die. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, what Chris is saying, spot on. This is the introduction to a letter. Like, what's hilarious about this is this is used as proof that God wants you to prosper and be in health. This is actually as if I was writing Liberty. Uh, hey, how's it going? I hope that your day is going well, and I hope your dog gets well. And I was to write that in the beginning of the letter. That's the, essentially what this is. Then, does that mean that her dog is going to get well? Does that mean that she is okay? It's not a promise. It's a hope. It's a hope. It's, it's and it also has nice. nothing to do with my dog getting well. Yes. <laughs> it has nothing to do with his dog. It has to do with her dog. These are the points that... I, exactly. And... These things get so shredded and torn out of context that now we create a systematic doctrine that is false. Mm -hmm. Just, we'll yes. Satan used to use scripture. Yes, Satan used yeah, scripture. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah. yeah. And the next one we talk about faith. Hey, guess what? We talked a little bit about this when we talk a little bit more. Because guess what? We have Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Mark 11, 22 to 24. This is a nice little uh, verse as well. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, anyone who says this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, Believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? It literally says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Sounds good to me. But where does this fall short? What's, what? Context. Context, yes. It's kind of, it's not going to happen immediately. <laughs> now, now to do it, you know. Exactly. Oh, and you get upset. Right. And that's actually a huge thing um, within the Park Prosperity Doctrine. Typically, if something didn't happen for you, it's you because you didn't have enough faith. You, it's your fault. Right? It's your fault. It's you your fault. Of course, it's not the church's fault. It's not God's fault. Definitely mm -hmm. not God's fault. It's your fault. Mm -hmm. And that, once again, comes back into cultic issues that, you know, the manipulation of leaders versus these members themselves. So, yeah. We get back into faith, we start finding that the nuance of what faith is, we kind of lose that and instead focus on ourselves. We focus on who we are and not on who God is and what his intention for faith was. Then we also have good old cultic issues. Not really scripture, but I kind of wanted to focus on some things that, are, that were common in my church to kind of share that with you. So knowledge is incomplete. They believe that knowledge is incomplete? Uh, no, the knowledge that they gave was incomplete. So basically, oh, taking the Bible text? Or? Give me a second. I'm lost in my notes. Yeah, so that more or less comes into your context. So the knowledge that they give is an incomplete picture of what the Bible actually says. So when things are taken out of context, that's a huge thing. Um, an indoctrinated mindset. So when you think about something, like if I was to ask, what do you think of faith? You guys can give me some nuance, some uh, items to think about, like some scriptures, some examples. With the indoctrinated mindset that people had, it was always like this specific thing or this group of things and nothing else. Anything outside of that wasn't, wasn't faith. It wasn't you know, prosperity. It wasn't the gospel. You are taught this is what you have to believe, and you believe it. And people do. I did for many years. My parents still within that uh, sort of cultish mindset, unfortunately. And then there's kind of a, a really hilarious thing that happened, like looking back, was the next two items. There were a variety of translations, and there was also a focus on the King James Version. So they would use, and this is something that I also want to warn you not to do, they use a variety of translations to make sure that they get the specific wording that they wanted in a scripture. So if it said something that they didn't like or they didn't use the right word, they would switch to a different translation that did, uh -huh. which took them along the path of you would find, you would listen to like 12 different 
translations within the same sermon just simply because it had the right word, it had the right, the right focus. And then at the same time, which didn't make a lick of sense to me later on, they also, and a lot of churches believe, that the King James Version is the only way to go. There might even be some people in this room who still believe that. I'd like to say, please don't believe that. In fact, I might also argue the Berean Literal Bible is the closest to word for word. I took, the, I took a Greek class, and it was as close to one to one translation as possible. Well, King the James. NAS? <laughs> the NASB is close. It is my favorite translation, but the oh. Berean Literal Bible is super good. But then it comes down to what the translations are used for, and you're like, okay, well, this is thought for thought, this is word for word, paraphrase, blah, blah, blah. We're not getting into that. Point being, they focused on the KJV until it didn't meet the agenda of what they were trying to say. And then they would use a variety. So it would almost be kind of like, so I feel like I've encountered this a couple times, is it's like the focus on the KJV becomes part of that isolation. Mm -hmm. um, you say that because we do this, then any believer you meet who's not using the KJV, you know you can ignore them. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much that we're that loyal to KJV, but it's just a good sounding tool to tell you why you shouldn't listen to people who contradict. Hi. Mm -hmm. Is that they're walking in there with an ESV? Well, they don't have the KJV. You got the ESV? <laughs> <laughs> it's a really quick way to cross somebody off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The NIV, the nearly inspired version. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, so some other things that I went through. Shame. When I stepped away from that faith, it caused me to have a lot of issues with like I lost friendships I lost relationships with my family like it was a tough time in my life and I'll get into a little bit later but like I had my, my best friend Alex he for the entire time I was part of that church he never once believed that it was right and he always tried to lead me in the right direction but I never listened but when I finally came to the conclusion myself and stepped away he was right there get a friend like that man <laughs> but I just said praise God. Yes, definitely. Um, and that happens a lot. So like I mentioned, my old friend who was Jehovah's Witness, he lost friendships. He lost connection with his family. Like um, He was also divorced at the time. And because of that, it ended up being um, like he had a hard time relating to his kids because his kids would still go to that church, but he wouldn't. So now you got kind of an issue there. And then the divorce proceedings, well, guess what? He also can't indoctrinate his children into a different religious belief because of the court proceedings. Issues like that arise. Um, there was an emotional toll that, you know, I'd lost my family. I lost a lot of my friends and had to kind of go about life uh, myself. Which is like I said, I was 18. I was in college at the time when I finally stepped away. That was a, a big point in my life where things kind of took a turn. And then there's a potential for relapse. Now, this didn't happen to me, but it did happen to my Jehovah's Witness friend. He actually ended up stepping away from stepping away from the faith and went back to Jehovah's Witness much later on. And to me, I kind of find that depressing because after all this work that was done in his life, after being torn from a toxic situation of being in a cult, he ended up just going back to it because it was what he knew. It's where his friends were. It's where people accepted him. We're at. And that's how it is for a lot of people. And then there's the issue of keeping people in. So I mentioned before about like the pastors and stuff like that, talking about this is what you believe. We believe this church. We believe this set of pastors. We believe these leaders are our leaders. When it came down to it, if you were to try and leave the church, you were encouraged to watch online. You were encouraged, oh, you can watch also these pastors that are going over here. Or you were basically told not to leave. Just, yeah, don't, don't move away. Instead, this is where your church is. This is where you need to be. Those are the kinds of things that restricted the freedom that caused a lot of people to uh, maintain that. So then it comes down to the latter part of my testimony. So I am no longer in that uh, frame of mind. I'm no longer part of that religious system. <laughs> Praise God for that. <laughs> so how do you save me? How do you get me out of that situation? The question kind of arrives to, well, it varies, because everybody's story is different. 
I can tell you about me. And um, I mentioned Alex, my friend. He was there as, as an anchor. So if you are trying to pull somebody else out of a bad situation, first thing is you got to be there. you got to be there as a friend and also be there as an anchor. Uh, you speak in love. Like, you don't condemn their religious beliefs every single time that you see them. That's, that's not going to help anybody. Um, you lead by example. Because if I'm living a lifestyle of sin and I'm trying to bring somebody else out of a lifestyle that is actually maybe doesn't look bad, well, I'm causing them to stumble. I'm not going to help them. Always remain in contact. That was a huge thing for my friend Alex and I because I talk to him on the regular, but had that not been the case, I don't know what would have happened. But instead, he was there. I could ask him questions. Like, as far as maturity in the faith, I would say maybe he was he was just a layman. He wasn't a pastor, but he was a friend, and he was solid, and he was stable. You don't have to be anybody in particular to help bring somebody out of a, a culture situation. And uh, finding their beliefs and priority points. Find places where you agree, because... A great place to start, especially if you're talking about a Christian cult, is you both believe in God, don't you? Like, you believe in the one true living God. You believe that the Bible is the true scripture, right? And there might be some variations, something like that, but you can find a point of agreement. Find where you relate, start building off of that. Um, it's a bit difficult, but try to determine if they are, are actually truly saved. There are some people, like, Imagine if you were going to a Jehovah's Witness church. I know I've been dogging on Jehovah's Witness a lot. It's because it's a lot more personal than me. So yeah. <laughs> like, imagine you've been going to a Jehovah's Witness church this whole time. You don't believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but instead he was just a good man, a good teacher. And you were baptized in that church. Well, should you be baptized again in your new faith? Should you not? Is this person actually saved if they don't believe that? Maybe maybe not, because that's kind of an essential doctrine. Find out where they are in their salvation Get them to a point where you lead them along a path, you of course force them to, until you can actually say, okay, this person I know is on the right track. And then, of course, continue to lead them, continue to be their, uh, their anchor. Um, find how much God is a priority in their lives, because what ends up happening is a huge chunk of churchgoers in churches today, I might argue up to 50% of people who attend church today are not Christians. I, I feel like that's a low estimate, personally, if I was to say 50-50. Because, you, you know, you can talk about, like, well, you got faith and how that, how actual real faith pertains to your salvation and how James talks about faith without works is dead. And you can go into all kinds of things like that. But ultimately, when you're talking about a one-on-one -on -one uh, relationship with that person, you have to figure out where is God in their lives? Is it, I'm a Christian, check that box? Or is it, God is the forerunner of my life and everything I do revolves around him. It's a huge spectrum of people who claim to be Christians who do anything in between those. Uh, something that my dad does that really drives me out of my mind is he likes to give one-liners. Please don't do that. <laughs> so when talking about, like, you know, for example, I was having, like, my mom is a lot more open-minded to a lot of things. She's still in the prosperity doctor mindset, but she's more open to things. And I, once again, I have to find that point of agreement where we can talk and stuff like that. Um, my dad, not so much. Love my dad, love my parents. I got, I have good parents. They're very caring, very generous people. That is a side effect of the prosperity doctrine is they are taught to give and they do give a lot. Um, just unfortunately for the wrong reasons, but regardless, um, I was having a conversation with my dad one day and we were talking about like, I just basically said, you know, I, I really don't believe in the prosperity doctrine. He's like, well, then I guess you don't have to be wealthy. And it's like, oh. first of all, that one-liner did nothing for me. It made me frustrated. Second of all, it definitely didn't bring me back. Like, oh, you're right. I should now just go back to this to be wealthy. But it's like, that doesn't help anything. That didn't do anything for either of us. It just maybe made him feel a little bit better about his faith. Where... Instead, I replied because I was frustrated. Yeah, all I have to believe about it, all I have to worry about is the truth. Did that help him? Definitely not. Looking back on him, like I'm, I'm such an idiot. This was a moment where I could kind of minister to him, but instead I was frustrated because we were having a hard time. Welcome to our conversation where now 
that did nothing. He didn't convince me with a one-liner. I definitely didn't convince him with a one-liner. We should do that differently next time. Next is don't use negative statements, which is a self-defeating statement. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> oftentimes what people try to do is they're like, okay, well, this is how things are not. This is how things are not. It's not like this. God is not like this. Not, 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 not. No, 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 no. Instead, bringing things to be a more positive aspect. There are, of course, times where you can bring up negative things, but to always go with the, you know, the prosperity doctrine is wrong. The way that you believe is wrong. Instead of approaching it like that, you approach it as, well, this is what I believe, and this is what I believe the, the Bible says about X, Y, Z. Bringing that to a more positive statement, leading them along that path, instead of saying, you're wrong. Because last time I checked, most people, when they're told they're wrong, tend to not believe that they're wrong. Because they wouldn't <laughs> believe that they were wrong in the first place if they believed that they were wrong. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and also, don't use comparatives. So... This means that you compare this to this, like saying that the prosperity doctrine is like um, is like a bowl of soup that you pour out and you get nothing back in. Nobody knows what that means. The idea is that you don't compare two things that are completely different to each other in, in, uh, when talking about salvation, especially not their whole belief system. I think that's something maybe I didn't add in here so much as don't try to tear down the entire belief system at once. Mm -hmm. One little thing at a time. Yeah, because it's complicated because there's a lot of truth in there too. And that's what you have to do mm -hmm. on to it. Yes, and what's really interesting about um, talking about some of these scriptures that we that we talked about with uh, like these, for example, let's see. I'm going to do a good one. I wanted to do Ah, yes, Matthew 6.33. So does anybody know the context of this verse? Sermon on the Mount. It's a Sermon on the Mount. Huge chunk of text. This particular passage, what is Jesus talking about? All these things will be given to you. He's talking about food, water, and clothing. Food, water, and clothing. Your needs. Your basic necessities. That is exactly right. Because prior to this, if you take a step back, like five verses, it talks about, like, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to drink. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. The lilies of the field are, um, you know, clothed better than Solomon or whatever. And we get all these beautiful pictures of, hey, God meets your needs. But instead, we take that and remove it and come instead to all these things that we give to you. What are all these things? Well, health and wealth and prosperity and blah, blah, blah. And, Sticking, that's and the point, point there is that, that Matthew's making is not that you should should not make provision for them or ignore and just like believe God's going to give you it. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, idolatry question. Matthew's saying, are you, Matthew's saying, or Jesus is saying in this context, he's the one speaking, he's saying, you need to put me as a higher priority than your basic necessities of life. I need to even be more important to you than getting your, the food and water and clothing you need to keep you alive. In other words, I'm more important than life itself. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, choose me, I'll take care of your needs. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that... And make you rich, no. <laughs> <laughs> And that, that segues pretty nicely into, well, then we talk about, what about faith? So when we talk about faith and getting the things that, you know, God says that he will give you, because it says, you know, God provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And it also says here that, you know, you can... Where, where is it? This is what I was thinking of. I'm going crazy. Give me a second. Yeah, so faith is the substance of things hopeful, the evidence of things not seen. And then we go into Mark, where it says, Have faith in God. And truly I tell you, anyone who says this mountain, be removed, through cast in the sea, blah, blah, blah. And I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. The nuance that's lost in the prosperity doctrine is, what are you supposed to ask for? But that was a huge thing for me that kind of convinced me otherwise, is when you talk about, like, well, I can ask for whatever, right? I can ask for God to give me a million dollars. Well, the problem is that you're not supposed to ask for a million dollars. Because, as the Bible says elsewhere, if you ask with impure motives, um, then, then it has all that <laughs> that goes along with it, where, hey, guess what? You ask for selfish things. You ask, but you don't receive, because you ask with selfish motives. 
And what do you know? That verse kind of tears apart all of this theology and instead gives us basically nothing. So it would be fair to say it's almost, I always say like don't use comparatives, but we use a comparison. <laughs> but it's almost like if you met someone who's hungry, telling them that they're hungry isn't going to help them. Telling them why they're hungry isn't really going to help them. Telling them, you know, that they shouldn't be hungry isn't going to help them. You need to bring them food. And so in this case, it's like, rather than focusing on attacking the doctrines, telling them why what they believe is wrong, or why what they believe is helping them, or, or all those things, it's better to go ahead and bring them the real food. And that's maybe, you know, talking about what, what you do believe scriptures mean, or even talking about ways in which God has answered your prayers or has blessed you that are actually consistent with what scripture is actually saying God will do when he answers your prayers or bless you. We're talking about blessings that aren't a literal prosperity or money in your pocket, but the ways in which, you know, people have poured into you and ministered to you and that was a blessing. You know, you're, you're, so instead of focusing on just telling, hey, you're hungry, you know, bring the food. Hey, this is the food God's given me. And, and show them that food and maybe hopefully feed their hunger. Yeah, and that's like we're Sam, Jessica, and I were talking about like humanitarian efforts, which you know, good analogy there. Where like what's great about humanitarian Christian humanitarian uh, ministries is like they they go out and meet needs, but they don't just meet needs; they also preach the gospel while meeting needs, and that I feel like is a huge, very important thing with especially people who are lost in a cold. Where you meet their needs, you find out where they are, you also preach the gospel. Yeah, the truth will create the conflict that makes them have to rethink things right. rather than just parking out the door. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm thinking of Peter, I mean, Paul, and when he said, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in. So it's, it's regardless, it's going back to our relationship with the Lord rather than what we think we need. Right, yeah. Um, There's so many evidences of, of people that were in the midst of living for the Lord and were under persecution and sickness and famine and <laughs> every other type of hardship that when you take the version of uh, faith that, that the prosperity gospel has, it doesn't hold up to scrutiny with you in you know, the own books of the verses they're quoting. <laughs> right. Yep. Which... I was just about to say something about that. <laughs> so, like, when it comes to here, I brought up uh, some of the healing scripture. Um, does anybody know what Isaiah fifty three talks about? Yeah, yeah. not physical. <laughs> so we got good old suffering servant, which we believe to be Jesus, and it gives us a nice. He was bruised for our transgressions. He was pierced for our iniquities. Um, the chastisement of our sins was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Beautiful verse, wonderful. So, does that mean that we're healed? Well, actually, if you look into that, well, it kind of, sort of, but also kind of not, it's like, welcome to nuance, and we end up finding more value in the physical healing than in the spiritual healing, where, yes, like, you look at Jesus' ministry, he went and healed people. He literally physically healed people, but that wasn't his focus. Like, yeah, he had a healing ministry. He went out, and people would touch his clothes and be healed. Like, it was insane. But instead, he didn't he didn't give a rip about healing people. He wanted to save people, which was way more important. And if anybody today had like a legitimate healing ministry, like people would be flung to them 24-7. Which right, Jesus. Like, <laughs> his healing was just to prove that he was God. Yes, yeah. exactly. And it proved that he was God. It had a different purpose. It was not his mission. His mission was to preach the gospel to all nations. It was a means to an end, not the end. Yes, it was a means to an end. And his ministry is what drove people to him. His ministry proved that he was God. Um, his ministry helped him disciple others. I mean, he got several things that it went and did, but not his focus. He was focused on other things. And I also like to kind of contrast these verses when we talk about healing with, what about Paul? He said that there was a thorn in his side, that he prayed for God to remove it from him, and he didn't. And I think that's kind of a hilarious verse because it's like, well, first of all, we don't know what the thorn is exactly, but more or less, we can attest to it being something bad. Regardless of whether it was a person or whether it was actually a pain that he had to suffer with, what ended up being a negative thing was actually a moment for 
um, for Paul to grow and for him to trust in God more. I also think, oh, forget his name, there's a, an inspirational speaker who I have the utmost respect for who has no arms and no legs. Nick Wojcik. Nick Wojcik, that's a dude. He is a wonderful, hilarious guy. No arms, no legs. Blows my mind how influential he is. And he has no appendages that make his life really hard. Me, with four appendages, have a much harder time making as big of a difference as he did. And he was asked, if you could have your arms and legs back, would you? And he said no, not in a million years. The ability for him to change people's lives with no arms and no legs was worth significantly more than just having arms and legs and being able to operate in life normally. For him, his affliction was a praise God moment. It was hard for him. James won, you know, kind of all joined by brothers. He faced various struggles, yes. Definitely. He's like to be content. But he does have he does have shoes and he does have a full shirt and pants because yes. he is believing that God can heal him at any moment. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And to me I think that's just beautiful. Now that's kind of how we should approach when people want to be healed, when people talk about being healed. Why don't we count it all joy when we face various trials? Why don't we find joy in the affliction? Like, I've heard it said that, and, you know, this isn't scripture, but I think it's clever, that if your life is going well, then that means Satan is not paying attention to you. And if Satan's not paying attention to you, it means you're not doing your ministry. Mm -hmm. So you think about that, or it's like, wow, life is going really well, me going about my life in whatever capacity that I like. But if I'm not following God, then my life of pleasure, my life of comfort is meaningless. <laughs> And yeah. So, in conclusion, cults may be something that we don't like to think about, feels really scary, but it's actually a real issue that has real world effects, probably on people that you know. And it's especially dangerous in churches, and especially even more dangerous in Christian churches. Because, sure, you can look at other religions and say, well, that's a false. Uh, so they believe in a false god, and their religious system is, is heresy, and they're going to go to hell, unfortunately. What's way worse than that is to look at a church and go, I think that they're saved, but they're actually not. They look good on the outside, but they're actually, you know, what's the analogy? The cup is cleaned on the outside, but is dirty on the inside. These people might be Pharisees, kind of idea. You mean Christian churches in that you mean they use a Bible for public preaching. So like that's <laughs> for <what it's>, <laughs> yes. So, yes. 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 Same yes. Christian churches. Okay. Yeah. Get, yeah. get nice air quotes. So they're using the Bible, but that's yes. just dangerous, right? Right. And, and that's why it's the most dangerous because like that can be all of us here could know several churches that look good on the outside, but they're none of them are believers because they believe in a false country. And it's just simply how it goes. Something that has really helped me sort of wrap my mind around this is kind of coming to the conclusion that I think just not only in prosperity churches, but I think just generally in American churches, and I'm only speaking, I'm not saying this isn't a problem elsewhere in the world, I'm sure it is, but I don't have enough experience elsewhere in the world um, to say this. But my, I think what I've come to the conclusion is that, that largely, even the ones that don't end up believing in prosperity gospel or prosperity doctrine, largely American churches don't have an actual biblical definition of the word faith. And so we're, we're starting out <laughs> uh, yeah, crippled. And so so we, for some of us, we look at the results of, of some of the things that you experience, and we go, well, I know that's nonsense, but we still have a hard problem pointing out why. And I think it starts with the fact that we're, we, we, we have a faulty definition of the word faith. Because if you start off with that way, you start getting, you can, you can get off track and you might not realize it until you're in the midst of believing that God's going to give me $2 million tomorrow just because I think so. Well, and with that, biblical hermeneutics, right? 
The yes. Bible talks about faith everywhere, but it's really important that we come to it with a biblical theology. It's yes. Superior. No, I'm joking. It's a yeah. Yeah. I'm running a joke of I like biblical theology more than like systematic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's important that we, when we develop our systematic theology or our definition of faith from the Bible, that we mm-hmm. recognize all of its nuances that come from each of the authors. Uh, it's yeah. not all equal. Right, right. Exactly. And, and um, I don't know how many of you have heard of the White Horse Inn podcast, and podcasts yeah. I listen to re- regularly, but they did a series last fall, I want to say, a short series addressing the prosperity gospel. And one of the things they did was they took significant time looking at what, what is biblical faith. And the Hebrews 11 1 passage in particular was addressed at one point, and, you know, like, we, I think in American culture, we sort of think of we think of faith as believing in something when you don't have the evidence for it. <laughs> that's not faith. That's foolishness. I mean, it, because if you think of what what is it, what, you know, we can all agree that if, if the resurrection, if we can't hold to the resurrection, if the, if the truth of the resurrection falls, then our entire faith falls. Well, why does Paul and other authors spend so much time on the resurrection, and like I mean, I mean, Paul argues very clearly: if the resurrection falls, the, the whole faith falls. Well, what's he? You know, why, why is that such a big deal? And why why is he pointing out all the witnesses? He's giving us tangible, measurable proof of the of the resurrection. And you know, I know Tim has talked about sending somebody from his church who was having some questions about their faith. Is he well, go research the resurrection? There's. For by any by any standards that we use today of proving something, the resurrection has a, a, a ton of evidence. And so faith is not a believing in something that we don't have the evidence for, it's believing in something we do have the evidence for. And it, 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 particularly I'm talking about saving faith here. Um, so I guess my point is, like, if we again coming around, we, we can't we can't start with a faulty definition of the word faith and then expect to arrive at a biblical version of life <laughs> or a biblical gospel. We're going to we're going to get off track. And whether we end up way on the crazy end, like some of what you experience, or whether we only get halfway and it doesn't get too weird, we might still be <laughs> believing some things that are that is nonsense because we started with a bad definition. Absolutely. And go along with that, something that Sam and I joke about is semantics. So the study of words and what words mean and yeah. what definitions things have. I always, like for every study that I will ever do, I always start with a definition. Mm-hmm. Because that is like you, to understand something, you have to understand what that word means. Because I always just to kind of waltz in here and talk about, hey, we're going to start talking about UD Chianism. And like <laughs> nobody has any idea what that means. It was a heresy and it was wrong. You shouldn't believe in UD Chianism. People are like, what the flying heck is UDG? <laughs> <laughs> was, really was it? It might have been. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, point being, like, you have to come in even with simple words like faith. We think about faith. People are named faith. Nobody's named UDGism. That was our next chapter. That's the next one. <laughs> so, even simple words like uh, a couple weeks ago, Mind King. We talked about doctrine. I put down a definition of doctrine. Hey, what does doctrine mean? We even systematic theology. What is systematic theology? We, the simpler words, the complicated words. To understand the words themselves helps you build yes, a foundation. Uh, yeah. uh, I have a practical question for you. Uh, mm-hmm. See what your thoughts are on it. So I have a friend who I follow on Facebook and whatnot. I know from college. Uh, he's recently joined a very highly prosperity doctor church, right? That, Apostles and prophets preach over him and give him ministry. Now he's in Africa and missions, and he was talking about how that was, was it was like a hundred thousand people got saved last night from this rally. And, you know, the fool on the back. How do I help him? Like, I have some level of friendship with him. It's a little weak, but like, what does that look like to help somebody who is, you know, in it? Right? They're seeing it. They're praying over people. They, you know, hook line and sinker, see the evidence of it. Right? What, what do I do practically for? That person. Yeah, well, it's a tough situation. But, um, to, we talked a little bit about this before. And, um, there was actually a, a missionary that I knew a long time ago after I was out of the prosperity doctrine. But, um, he 
basically said, like, he, he went to uh, Pakistan, and in Pakistan, he was told, please don't share any prosperity doctrine. The people here are very poor, and they, they, we need to not have them believe that they can be rich through believing in God. That was what the church leaders in Pakistan, in a third world country, were saying, which is just hilarious to me. But um, to put it with that, like, first of all, I would say build a relationship with a better one and a more practical one. One that is built on friendship, not just the Bible, but then also the Bible. One that you're able to kind of communicate with. Once again, we went over some of the, yeah. the aspects of how to save people, be on their level, find points of uh, agreement, and kind of build things with that. And it's really difficult because, like, yes, you can see. Like, I, I mentioned before, my church had a regular attendance of a thousand plus. Like, you can see people by their fruits, right? Well, not exactly in, that, in those kinds of contexts. Like, if we had a million people who were saved, well, that doesn't necessarily mean anything if they were saved under a false pretense. And so these are the kinds of things where it's like, well, sure, people came to their to an under, to an understanding of who Jesus is, but maybe a broken one. So uh, something I talk about a lot is it's hard to, it, when you learn something, it's much harder to unlearn it. I can attest to that when talking about it with, uh, like some of those verses I shared with you about faith and about healing, about um, you know prayer and what that can do for you. It took me a long time, like literal years, to come to the conclusion that I just shared with you tonight with things because I was still confused. Like it was like, okay, well, if this is wrong, then tell me how it's wrong. And nobody could. Nobody had that practical experience of, well, this is exactly what it means, and this is exactly the nuance that, you, that the author is kind of going for. And so that would be something that you would talk to your friend about, is, hey, these are the scriptures that you know, like, here are the nuances of them. And these are, you know, when we talk about Paul and his teachings, he's kind of talking about this, 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 and this. And here's Matthew and what he proclaims in his gospel, is talking about this, 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 and this. These are the nuances about each of these. Challenging and thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The obvious answer is pray, 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 pray. And pray, of course. <laughs> don't, don't pray. Prayers teach my religion. <laughs> well, I, how do you interact with your parents on this now? I mean, I mean, I, mean, I, I have people very close to me that uh, doesn't sound like they're quite where your church was, but they're not real far from it. <laughs> um, and of course, everything's you know, escaped. Right. I mean, we've had some frank conversations about it, but so far I've been unsuccessful at <laughs> convincing them otherwise. So I was just curious if you have any, like, how do you interact with your parents and people you're close to on this now? Like, what do you... Yeah. So, like I said, it's kind of hard because the relationship was more or less destroyed when I walked yes. away. And so it was a slow process building back up that relationship. I feel like we're in a good place right now. Love my parents. They know where you stand. They yeah, they're not in, in the same church as them. Right. They're in the same church as you grew up there. Right. Don't say you're an adult now. Yeah, it, <laughs> it does. Not the baby. Yeah. Not the baby anymore, but I'm still the baby. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it took a long, it was a long time. It was a process. We're talking literal years for me to get to the point where I'm like, okay, well, this is what I believe. This is why I believe it. I was confident in it. And my parents, like, fortunately for me, I have I have solid parents, just character-wise. They're very loving. So when I kind of set my foot down and said, this is what I believe and I'm not going back, they finally came to an understanding eventually that, okay, this is where we're at. So then my mom, she, like, I, I went and took some uh, master's classes in divinity, which is basically biblical studies. And, like, I've done a lot of apologetics myself in my own time, um, lots of different studies of the Bible in my own time, reading the Bible cover to cover multiple times, like all that good biblical study stuff. And in the midst of that, I grew a reputation with, especially my mom, that I know scripture. Mm -hmm. And that was a long process as well. Like all of these things are long times, there's no instant, instant cure for them. Because of this long process that we had, because of the understanding that I had gotten over scripture, my mom comes and asks me questions, not pertaining to prosperity doctrine, just questions about scripture. Like, well, what does this mean? I can, so many times my mom has asked me about uh, women's position in ministry. That's always a difficult topic. <laughs> but like uh, speaking in tongues is a classic one. And 
I literally sat down with her one day and we read through the entirety of 1 Corinthians 11, 12, and 13. We kind of just like broke down. This is what this says. This is what this says. This is what this says. And still she believes in speaking in tongues. They do that at their church? And yes. That is another thing. Without um, a mention yes. Just everybody speaking in tongues at once. Right. Um, yeah, so there, the Faith Life Church is what you might call more of a Pentecostal church or a charismatic church. So things like that. Um, and then, last thing that I've said multiple times, be there as a friend, be there for them. And then build your relationship off of friendship. Also, we can put the Bible, its process, those things. <laughs> yep. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.